strange to be here. It's funny to be here, actually. Um, I've sat in uncomfortable circles of chairs in this very room <laughs> over several years. And I have a funny kind of um, familial connection with the building because my mother uh, trained here as a teacher back in the 50s. Uh, and then, by pure coincidence, this week my daughter was here working with Pam uh, doing a, a diploma in leadership development, and uh, she had a great experience. So, as Colm has said, I did, I did the, the three academic years here over a six year period. I'm a slow learner. Um, <laughs> but it's good to be back, and it's great to see such a, an interest in, uh, in the subject matter. Um, I'm here to talk about vertical development. Uh, some of you may know it really well, some of you may just be new to the topic. Um, so I'm clinging to this theory with great hope at the age of 58. Uh, the idea that I might develop beyond where I'm currently at is a source of great optimism for me. Um, two weeks ago I came back from Cape Cod where I, I did the Cape Cod training in, in the Cape Cod model, the Cape Cod uh, Gestalt model. And um, while I was there, I worked with a fantastic woman, Carol Brockman, uh, 79 years of age. She's about yo high, and she, her intellect is as sharp as a tack, a massive heart, a wonderful presence. So the prospect of developing to that level uh, takes a lot of optimism. But anyway, it's nice to think that I'd be able to do some work uh, 20 years from now. So. I was introduced to this concept about uh, 12 years ago by Tony O'Riordan in Cork. Some of you may have come across Tony, a great character, a uh, great coach. Uh, when he gave me a Harvard Business Review article called The Seven Transformations of Leadership, which I sent out for people to have a look at before this evening. Uh, and I was instantly intrigued by this idea that uh, there were levels of leadership and that you could transform. Um, the details of them are there if you want to look through them later, but on reading it, I could instantly associate with my own kind of shift in development and with the various people that I, that I worked with. Um, so I, I then came here to do the first uh, coach training program and <coughs> Robert Keegan's work was uh, on, the, on the menu and immunity to change and that whole adult development piece, which I guess you've probably all been dipped in. Um, so that fascinated me further, and then I did a workshop with, with Keegan in Cork uh, a couple of years later. Um, so I was further down the rabbit hole, um, and then I went to train in the UK with David Rook, uh, co-author of that article. Uh, Karen Ellis was also there, uh, and a guy called Philip Hayden, who was the R&D director with Heart Hill, uh, and trained as an accredited user of the leadership development framework. So um, I've been tricking around with it for years and it kind of forms a core part of my one-to-one -one coaching and my team <coughs> coaching. And apologies for the state of the poster on the right there, but it was used with the team. So the yellow spots represent the distribution of that particular team uh, across the spectrum of uh, levels of development. And to our surprise, when that group got together, the leader of the team was further back than anybody else and it caused a lot of difficulty. Um, but anyway, that's why it's so down here. It's been around for a while. So look, the, these are the questions uh, that were in the invitation and these are the questions that got you here. Uh, so I'm going to try and touch base on all of these questions um, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll, you'll have some questions for me at the end. I may aim to finish by about 7.15, maybe a little bit earlier, and we can have some questions and answers. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have questions, jot them down and hold them to the end, if, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. It would be remiss of me not to have a check-in. Um, and of course, because there's so many people here, we can't do it individually. But what I'd like you to do is to pair up with somebody. Uh, and just play around with two questions for four or five minutes. I call time. So the two questions are, how are you? And what are you hoping to get from this session? You okay to do that? Yeah. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. 
nervous excited to be here. It's great to be back. Very grateful to Colin and to, to Pam for supporting this. And uh, it's great to see Jeff here. Jeff Pellin. Yeah, uh, and I also have a friend of mine here, Paul O'Donoghue. It's a really courageous move on my, my behalf because Paul is the president of the Irish Skeptics Society. <laughs> so he'll be taking copious notes. So nothing will pass him. Um, and, and to all of my colleagues that I travelled on the journey with that are here, it's good to see you again. So when I, when I thought about my answer to the second question, uh, I came up with a kind of a glib thing that said, if you know a lot about adult development coming here, I hope that at the end of this you might know a little bit more. And if you knew very little about adult development, maybe you'd know a lot at the end of this. But uh, that was a bit horizontal, and I'll explain that later. Um, so what I'm really motivated by is that I'd arouse your curiosity and that you'd go away in the spirit of inquiry and, and that it might drive you to some developmental inquiry into your own meaning making and, and what's called action logic, a term I'll explain later on. Um, so let, let me start by, by positioning this notion of development as an aspect or a facet of our individuality. We're all, we're all different, yeah? What, what is it that makes us different? What, what are the, the facets of individuality? Anybody? Not you, Carl. Different experiences. Personality. Hmm? Different experiences. Experience? Mm. Personality. Personality. Beliefs. Pardon? Beliefs. Beliefs. Yeah. Relationships. Relationships. Yes. And it's not on my list. The specific combination, random, uh, of our genetic makeup with the upbringing that we acquired in childhood that we don't. Right. So, so the, there's lots of stuff that makes us up. Um, and this is a list I've been kind of gathering, and, and I have another one to add to it now. Relationships is not up there, but I guess possibly in, covered by environment, maybe. So, so there's our, our nature, our biology, what we kind of got from mom and dad and the generations before by way of DNA and, and a way that we potentially might survive when we arrive here. And then <clears throat> we're worked upon by our experience, uh, our, our nurture. So, so there's lots of stuff, personality, motivation, temperament, sexuality, um, our attachment style, our values, our beliefs, our habits. Uh, our biases, some that were very blind to a lot of the time. Our experience, our environment. And if Paul had his way, I'd say that's probably the only thing in the slide because he's a big Skinner fan, yeah? Skinnerian behaviorism. Uh, our life stage and our preferences at that stage is a big factor for us. Uh, our health and well being, physical health, men mental health, emotional state. Things like our skills, talents, and abilities, our various intelligences, IQ, EQ. Uh, and then there's this notion of there being a level of development, uh, sometimes talked about as our view of the world, our, our action logic, or our meaning making 
structure. Um, so this is what I'm talking about, but it's, it's just one aspect of who we are, but it's an important aspect. It's impinged upon by all of the other aspects, and it in turn impinges upon them to a certain degree. So in Gestalt's terms, I guess what we'd say is this is the field from which we emerge of a day, and every day we'd be slightly different. Um, so to talk then specifically about um, adult development, where, where did this theory emerge from? Well, basically it was the taking up of the baton from the likes of Piaget and others who had done work to understand the levels of development in childhood. Um, and, and they're quite definable. And there's lots of science out there to show that there's a, there's a distinct and definable and measurable progression in children. And those of you that have children will remember back to a time when they were small, perhaps, and they were in the bath, and you took out the plug and the water started to go down, and the kids would back up because their sense was that if the water is going down there, I might go down there too. At that stage, they, they don't have a fully formed perspective on their scale relative to everything else. Or you might remember a time when you played hide and seek with them, and they pulled the curtain over their head, and the idea being that I can't see him, so he can't see me. Um, I read a wonderful story about Piaget's work recently, where uh, it described his interview with a little girl, where he was trying to make sense of how she was making sense of things. And he asked her a question. The question was, what makes the wind? And the little girl thought for a moment and said, the trees, right? A very clever answer, because she knew that this happens, right? So if this is happening here, then what's happening out there is that the trees are making the wind. And that's what Piaget termed an accommodation. She was able to understand the question she couldn't answer by accommodating it through what she knew already. But at some stage in her development, she found herself outside with wind and no trees. So she had to assimilate a new perspective and a different understanding of what makes the wind. And that kind of encapsulates this notion of development, a continuous understanding of the environment that we're in by accommodating it through we, what we know already, or having to assimilate a new understanding where we understand things differently. Um, the belief, of course, uh, back, in, back in the 50s and 60s was that this developmental process finished when you were finished growing. So when you kind of reached your full height, that was it, you didn't, you know, you developed very rapidly in childhood and very rapidly again in adolescence, but then when you reached your full height, that was you, and you kind of flatlined for, from there, unless you were unlucky, in which case you might taper off at the end, uh, which is still a prospect, I guess. But, um, but now we know from adult development research and science that it's not the case, that there are levels of development, different levels of meaning making in adulthood. So, so what it is, this term vertical uh, development ha has come into kind of common use in recent times. Um, but the, the origins of this thesis can be found, its roots are in constructivist developmental theory. And constructivists believe that the world is not there waiting for us to find it objectively and that we all come across the same thing. Constructivism suggests that we, we create the world through our experiences, through our history, through the way we see it. We create the world. Developmentalists, on the other hand, believe that there is this idea of further development throughout our, our lives. You're probably all familiar with this. Is there anybody here who's not familiar with this? Does anybody here not see this? Based on how well known it is, yeah? Anybody have difficulty with it? Anybody sitting there saying, geez, I know there's two pictures up there, but I can only see one of them. Who sees the older woman? Who sees the younger woman? This says things about your sexuality, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> so, so it's a composite that, that allows us to see either a younger woman or an older woman, and some people can readily see both, right? 
But that's not the wonder about this. The wonder about this is that we can we can see a woman up there at all, because at the end of the day, it's a white background with black marks on it. <clears throat> and, and we create this notion uh, of, of it representing a woman. So it's a, it's a wonderful human capacity to be able to see things and, and to make something of them. Um, now you might have seen this for a while, but you remember it. Um, the strange reality about this is that we're doing this all day, every day. We're seeing things, we're imagining what they are, and we're, we're taking action on, on the back of it. Another good way to understand vertical development, I think, is to compare it to what it's not. Okay? So what it's not is horizontal development. And horizontal development is, uh, well, let me start by asking a question. Who here knows how to interpret a set of audited accounts? Yeah? So a skill, good skill, important skill, um, really worth having, yeah? And if you don't have it, you can go and get it. You can find somebody who knows how to do it, you can acquire the knowledge. If you apply that knowledge in practice on a regular basis, you'll develop the skill, okay? And that's what's known as horizontal development. The Irish Times article I, I sent you in the pre-reading, uh, an interview with Brian Glazer from Google, was making the point that uh, universities and MBA programs in particular, who screw to get off, uh, need to recognize the balance that needs to be struck between horizontal and vertical development because this idea of filling people's heads with knowledge and developing skills won't necessarily change how they are. So if you went off and learned how to interpret a set of audited accounts, it wouldn't kind of change your presence or it wouldn't change your impact necessarily. Uh, it might do at a board meeting if you, if you were able to raise some questions that you couldn't before. So, so horizontal development is distinctly different. It increases what you know, and it strengthens your technical expertise. It's essential for using known techniques to solve clearly defined problems, and, and it helps us to develop functional knowledge and skill that will strengthen our leadership capacity, our capability, and our toolkit. So it's hugely valuable. I don't mean to denigrate it in any way. We, we've got to do that. But we've also got to pay attention to vertical development, which is really about mindset transformation. It's about changing how we know things and how we think about things and how we interrogate things. Uh, so it, it involves growth, not just knowledge acquisition or skill. It, it improves how we frame and how we interpret situations and therefore it influences how we act. Uh, it's essential to address complex problems, and I'll come back to that notion of complexity later. Um, and it helps you to cultivate high-stakes relationships and to navigate rap rapidly changing and uncertain circumstances. Um, you'll hear a lot of talk nowadays about the fact that the word is VUCA, V-U-C-A, so volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And as the rate of connectivity between us increases, that that's an increasing phenomenon. Vertical development develops your capacity to lead in complexity. And, and a nice metaphor is that it represents a kind of an upgrading in your leadership operating system. So if you, if you com compare horizontal development to loading your system with new apps, uh, vertical development is about increasing the power of the platform on which the apps run so they can run more effectively. This is also a useful metaphor. So this, this is an oak tree. And let's imagine that it's the same oak tree at different stages. It's radically different as it goes through these significant transformations. So while you can look at this oak, this tree here and say, yeah, that's an oak tree. That looks to be a completely different uh, form, but it's the same tree. So that's a good metaphor for, for what vertical development does uh, to us. One of the most accessible writers in this space in recent years for me has been a guy called Nick Petrie. Uh, he published a couple of articles while working for the Centre for Creative Leadership and they're available online called Vertical Leaders uh, Part 1 and 2. He interviewed over 30 experts in the field uh, and kind of distilled his knowledge from them into 
a, a really understandable set of papers. And the upshot of it all was to suggest that there are kind of three broad categories of development in adulthood that we move through. And you'll recognize yourself in these. Starting off at dependent conformer. Robert Keegan's language here would be the socialized adult. We get to a position where we're conscious of the social norms. At work, we're a team player, faithful follower. We rely on authority. Uh, we seek direction and we align ourselves with others. We don't step out of line. So the social contract at that stage is really important. We develop from there into independent achievers. Uh, and at this stage, we're more independent in our thinking and more self-directed. We drive the agenda. We take a stand for what we believe in. And we're guided more by our internal compass. Uh, which equates to Keegan's self-authored stage. We're at the stage where some of that socialized stuff I still believe in, but some of it I'm not so sure about, so I start to question the social norms and I start to step out of them and I start to write my own script until I begin to realize that I'm not actually writing my own script. Other people are playing a part in writing me. And that's the stage when I develop into an interdependent collaboration where now I know the value of thinking with other people, because I know a lot, but relative to what can be known, I know very little. But if I can think together with others, together we, we, we can see systems and patterns and connections, and we can think more longer term. At this stage we can hold multi-frame perspectives. I can hold my own perspective, but I can understand yours and yours and yours, and not be discommoded by that. Earlier in my development, that would upset me greatly because my view is the right view, surely. There's only one right view. Um, but later on, we're, we're much more comfortable with, uh, with polarity and ambiguity and contradictions. So, what does this mean for leadership and organisations? And this was the question posed by Susan cook Greitel and Bill Torbert, the co-author with David Rook of that Seven Transformations article, and David himself, when they said about saying, well, right, if this adult development theory is for real, how can we apply the theory in practical terms at work? How can we take it and bring it out into the workplace? So they said about analysing how these things played out in leaders and, and developed this uh, seven-step uh, framework uh, of what they call action logics. And action logic I, I love as a term because it describes what we're doing. We make logic of situations and the logic we make drives us into action. So the, the action doesn't happen until we've kind of made the decision. But we know that we can make logic in different ways, which is interesting. So they, they said about developing this, and you can, you can uh, have a look at it later on, and you can get a sense uh, of the different levels of development. And it's, it's important to say that it's not a, a, a categorization model. So, uh, like a lot of uh, personality theories, and I have nothing against them, it's not a question, when we said about finding out what action logic people are using, we're not trying to box them into, oh, she's an achiever, she's an individualist, she's a strategist. What we're trying to find out is what is the range of action logic that the person is leaning on, because we can use them all. And the, the early ones, we, once we develop them, we have them, and we can drop back to them by accident or design. Um, and we can act out of one that we have developed and practiced. The ones we haven't practiced are less accessible to us, and we've got to practice them uh, to use them. There's a risk when you look at it that, that it might look at, like a, a hierarchical framework. Uh, but it would be a mistake to see it as a hierarchy because higher up is not necessarily better, depending on your circumstances. And it would al also be foolish to underrate the value of opportunist action logic. Because you can become the president of a big country using that type of action logic, right? Or the prime minister of a smaller one. Um, so, so it makes sense in those terms. Um, they're in us all. So it's not a question of, of us kind of pedantically stepping through them. Some of them we have developed, some of them we haven't developed yet, and if we do the work, we have access to them all. Okay, so 
If you have any questions, I'd be happy enough to answer them later on, and uh, we, we'll maybe come back around to it that way. So to this notion then of, of complexity, um, there's a recognition that the later stages of action logic or meaning making are much more useful when dealing with complex or chaotic situations. Um, the work of David Snowden, I don't know if people are familiar with Snowden's work on the Kinevan framework. Has anybody ever come across the Kinevan framework yet? Um, Google it and watch uh, Snowden on YouTube. It's a fascinating thesis. Um, if you take it that the purpose of management and leadership is to put order on disorder, then you might agree that it's useful to know the type of disorder you're dealing with. Uh, and this is what uh, the Kinevan framework does to us. It gives us a chance to be able to analyze what type of disorder. So some disorder is pretty straightforward uh, if, if you just use cause and effect as a kind of an analysis on a, on a simple problem, uh, you'll be able to find the root cause and you'll be able to sort it out. There are complicated problems where you'd have to do some deep analysis, but eventually you'll get to a stage where you'll be able to establish cause and effect and you'd be able to bring about order to that disorder. But none of that stuff works when it comes to complex problems. And a lot of our, our problems uh, nowadays in the world are revolve around this. We're trying to, to provide established fixes to, to problems we, we currently don't understand. I don't have time to go into it in any more detail. That's serious. That's right. <laughs> I might have said something that sounded like silly. Um, but, but this is the framework, and, and it's fascinating because we live in a world where we cannot predict what's going to happen next week or the following week. And that used to be the case. In business, you could do a, a two year plan and you could kind of feel reasonably satisfied that, that you know, the world would come to meet you and the odd thing might happen. So, so things like uh, leadership styles like command and control and predict and control worked in that environment. They don't work anymore because we cannot predict what's going to happen with complexity. So the very mindset we bring to those type of problems needs to be different. And those mindsets are well described as strategist alchemist, where, where we're able to we're able to sit with the problem. We're able to probe, sense and respond. We're able to experiment and adapt. We're able to listen to what other people are seeing of the problem. Because maybe the last guy in the door of your organization who's been in a couple of weeks has noticed that there's a screw loose at the back and if it falls off, the whole thing is going to come down. In the typical organization, he wouldn't be listened to because he's only just in the door. But if that kind of action logic is at play, everybody has a voice and, and can be heard. So that, that's a very brief introduction to the Kinevan framework, but it's a really interesting framework and another author I'd recommend uh, on the topic of complexity and a book called It's Not Complicated by Rick Nason, a uh, super book, uh, easy read, and, and it really nails down the issue. And I chose this quote from it. In times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And, and we see that happening to us all the time. Got a new bloody iPhone the other day, iPhone 11. Right, it does things differently to the last one. So, I, so I have to, I have to change the way I go about doing it. You know? um, okay. So, what is the relevance of vertical development to coaching? This is another one of the questions, and I'll give you a little break after this to uh, do some reflecting, um, because I'm conscious that I've been talking for a long time, and you might be tempted to fall asleep. I'm reliably informed the room sleeps 40. If you can feel <laughs> What's the most important skill in coaching, you think? Listening. 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 I knew that one was going to come first. Presence. Questions. Yeah? Um, a Socratic approach. Good questions. Uh, listening is key, too, of course. Um, but good questions are critically important in coaching. And, and what I have found over the years is that 
having a map of development and knowing where the coachee is perhaps on that development pathway helps me to ask better questions because I have a sense of where they are and what they might want to do with that in terms of either building out where they are, maybe letting go of some of their kind of trailing end development or maybe working on their leading end in terms of their development. Um, so from a coaching point of view, I, I found it hugely beneficial. Um, about two years ago, I, I did the profile with um, a school principal. I, I worked with the Department of Education on a, on a school principal's coaching project, leadership coaching project. And this guy, John, came to me and I actually emailed him earlier on in the week and I said, will you give me something to say? I'm giving this talk on Thursday night. Well, just something short, a couple of lines. Uh, but John profiled an alchemist, so they don't write a couple of lines. You know, he sent me a whole page. Uh, I actually cried when I read it last night, so I couldn't read it out here. It's too long. Not because I'd cry, I might too. But when we profiled John, he, he showed up at Alchemist, right? A most amazing mind. I mean, I remember the first coaching session I had with him. My head was bursting when I was finished. I had a most violent headache because he had these huge ideas, right? And, and he was hugely frustrated in his work because he felt, you know, he, he wasn't doing as good a job as he could be doing. In the meantime, he's driving these colleagues bananas because most of them want to open the school in the morning, teach the kids well, lock the place up in the evening and go home. John wants to change the education system. He wants to, he introduced last year, no homework. There was uproar. Mm -hmm. Parents were called, the kids even were upset, the teachers were upset. So he wants to, his, his frame of reference is completely different. He actually thought he was cracking up. And, and I mean, he sent me the page and he signed it off and he said, you can name me and I, I won't do that. But uh, he'd actually gone to his GP and the GP had put him on an SSRI because he diagnosed that he had anxiety disorder. And he ended up going back to the GP to say, no, that's not what it is. It's this. I'm just thinking much, much bigger than the job needs of me. So now he has a decision to make. How do I find a job that allows me to, to use what I have? Or how do I find an outlet for it outside of work? In the meantime, back at the ranch, uh, because I, I, I eventually went in and worked with the team, they, they've got him doing the expert achiever stuff. And, and where he's not prepared to do it, they've said, well, look, we'll, we'll bloody do it because we need stuff to be done. Um, so, so that's just a, an indication of how valuable it can be in, in coaching. Okay, so time for a little break, not to listen to me so much. How is vertical development assessed? So there are two well-recognized and validated processes uh, and a number of others kind of emergent. But uh, the, the, the most kind of respected are Robert Keegan's subject-object interview, a version of which Jennifer Garvey Berger also uses, and I sent you a little link to her video, uh, which I hope you enjoyed. Uh, and then there's uh, Dr. Jane Lovinger's Washington University Sentence Completion Test, which is what we use for the LDF. Uh, so in the Washington University Sentence Completion Test, we send people out, unlike the usual psychometric assessment where you're kind of ask them for, to respond to a question on a scale of one to five, and that kind of categorizes them. In this assessment, we just send them out 32 sentence stems, the start of a sentence, and the instruction is, finish the sentence. And when we get the assessment back, uh, we analyze the language. So I'm gonna take you through one of the sentence stems, and I invite you to complete it. I'm not gonna ask you what you've written down, uh, I'm not going to ask you to share it with anybody, so right away. Um, and then I'm going to show you seven different responses to the sentence stem. And I'll give you an indication of what the raters are looking for when they're assessing the language. So I'll give you five minutes. Is that too long? Probably is. I'll, I'll watch you do it. And Just one sentence. The thing I like about myself is... Wide open.
So hold that for a moment, and I'll take you through some real responses. Um, when we send out the sentence to completion assessment, we ask for people's permission to use their sentences for research purposes. Some people give us permission, excuse me, and some don't. But in this case, we got permission. So I'm going to take you through seven responses. And this is the first one. <laughs> the valid response. I think I like both myself because I have nice feet, yeah? Might be objectively true, even. I'm not sure. But there isn't a huge depth of thought. It's a kind of a, an instant response. And it doesn't go beyond the individual themselves. What do I like about myself? I have nice feet. Bang. <laughs> There's a little bit more in this one. The thing I like about myself is that people like me. So now I, I, I have a kind of a sense of how other people view me, and, and that's important to me. And if across 32 sentence stems we pick up a pattern of this type of thinking, where there's a concern for how people see me, and how people view me, and that that's important to me, we can reasonably assume that that's diplomatic action logic. I'm concerned about the, the social contract. This one is different again. Uh, what I like about myself is my sense of humour. So there's a skill involved here. He or she has a good sense of humour. They're able to crack a joke and make people laugh. It's a skill. And in responses that focus on skills, usually you'll see a pattern of expertise emerging uh, in the profile. So this one is classified at expert action logic and the logics are detailed on the poster there. The thing I like about myself is that I have abundant energy and drive and I can make things happen. You can feel the energy oozing off it. Right? Um, sense of excitement. I can get stuff done. Achiever, action logic. Uh, hugely valuable in, in organisations. Hugely energising. Longer and deeper, the thing I like about myself is that I'm trying to listen to my heart to the background noise of other people's expectations. So you get a kind of a sense that this person is on a treadmill and they're getting tired of it. I need to stop doing this, uh, but I can't let other people down, they expect me to do it. Uh, so so there's, there's, there's a lot more in that particular uh, sentence. At individualist there, the last one. This one then is at strategist. And what you see here, again, a lot more language used, different ideas in the sentence. What I like about myself is hard to find. Because when I settle on something, it has another less likable side. So here you see the awakening of an appreciation for polarity. Yeah, I know, I know I'm, I'm humorous and I'm able to crack a joke, but God, sometimes I really go over the top and I upset people, you know. So, so there's an appreciation of, of polarity. Um, but then there's this settling on, some, sometimes I can make a real difference to other people's lives. So you can see that there's a concern for other people and there's a passion to be out there influencing the world. In this final one, which is codified at, at Alchemist Action Logic, um, it's typical of what you'll see, a sort of self-deprecating introduction what I like about myself is my ability to lace my shoes without paying attention. Wow. Uh, as I think about pending daily functions, business propositions, expansions, enhancements, improvements, and our other job-related um, endeavours. So lots of stuff going on, and a capacity to be considerate of the minutia and expand out and move up and down that scale. Um, so. So that, that just gives you a flavour of, of how the sentence completion assessment works. And, and this is a deeper insight into what, what the rater is looking for. So they're looking for complexity of sentence structure or not. They're looking for the number of ideas, simple alternatives, contrasting or paradoxical. They look at the subject matter, the richness of it, the range of it, whether it's just considerate of me and, and my own little domain, or whether I, I talk about the state of the planet. Um, they also look for conformity. They look for <coughs> cliched responses. 
you know, so you'll get rule, one of the sentences, sentences rules are. So a cliche response, the rules are made to be broken. Later on you'll get rules are useful, but in certain circumstances they may have to be changed, as circumstances may not have been considered when the rule was made. So you get a more complex uh, thought process. And also there, there's a, a looking out for tone of voice which is a real giveaway, and it's kind of not in the, the, the cognitive reading of the sentence, it's more in the energy of it. So, so in the earlier uh, action logics, you get a lot of certainty, a lot of black and white thinking, uh, and there's a search all the time to give a right answer. This is what the answer is. Um, an achiever, typically, what you'll see is impatience, concern about time and about getting stuff done. And then the later, um, action logics, you'll see inquiry. You very often see questions being asked, I'm not so sure. So less certainty, uh, more kind of playfulness and self-deprecation. And at the later stages in some of the um, adult development writing, the alchemist is referred to as the magician or the clown uh, because it's kind of a falling away of ego and, and they're not really bothered about what, what people think. So th this is a kind of a deeper indicator of, of a verification of each level and what you might see in the sentences uh, and in the sentence structure. And it just really kind of repeats what I've said uh, earlier on here. Uh, it's a narrow view. It's right or wrong, good or bad, concern about myself. Uh, and further on, it's much more, oh, what state is the planet in? And what can I do about it? And what am I doing about it? Okay, nearly there. How can we support vertical development? Well, the first question to ask yourself is, should you? There's a philosophical question about, because development for its own sake is a questionable uh, process. Uh, people might be at uh, a mid-level of development, but it might be directly aligned with where they're at at work and in their life in, in general. Uh, so. so selling them the notion that they should go on a, a developmental uh, exploration uh, is, is questionable. It, it should come from people themselves. Um, if you do go about supporting somebody to develop, there, there's a, a wide range of things that can help people. The moves are different at different stages. So, so the developmental shift from, from expert action logic to a more achiever-centered action logic is a distinctly different move than the move from achiever to strategist, for example. An, an individualist, as it's called, in between those two is recognized as a kind of an interim journey between the two. So different things will work at different levels of development. And I think this is another kind of advantage to coaching, that if you know the sweet spot you're working in, your developmental intervention is more likely to, to hit that sweet spot. So, so lots of things like developmental inquiry, questioning your own logic, you know, and if I didn't use that logic and I used another logic, what, what, how would things have worked out? Uh, I, I have a strong sense that the Gestalt approach is hugely valuable, particularly at the later stages, where, where you're kind of more in touch with the whole system, you're grounded and in touch with what's going up for people in the moment. Dealing with unfinished business is very often useful in helping somebody to unhitch from an earlier action logic where under stress they might be inclined to drop back to diplomatic action logic and sometimes helping them to resolve an unfinished issue can be valuable. Emotional intelligence, important I think at all levels. Engaging in collective intelligence practices uh, and dialogue, listening. Polarity thinking is something that we can practice. This is what I think, what if I thought the opposite and deliberately go there rather than get fully invested in what you think is the right answer. <coughs> Reflective writing, spending time with somebody who you know to be further on. You've all probably had that experience and perhaps in your coaching given it to others. Coaching itself, mindfulness and awareness I think is huge. Um, and, and I could give a talk all on its own about that. Uh, somatic work is important. We talked a little bit about that Paul, beforehand. Um, yoga, Tai Chi, uh, Qigong, these things can be hugely useful. 
And even though I'm a committed non-theist, spiritual practices can add value as well. And if all of those things don't work, I recommend hedonism. <laughs> so the pursuit of happiness through pleasure alone, sex and drugs and rock and roll, <laughs> polarity thinking, maybe it's a better option. Okay, that's me, folks. I hope I haven't bored you to tears.